Well, John, here we are, New York. 18 months later. 18 months later. Um, two years later, actually. So it's two years since we met in San Diego, mm -hmm. and you said, have you still got your British passport? Mm -hmm. uh, are you able to move back to London because I've got a trial for you? And, um, and I did, obviously, and now we're 18 months into that trial, and I'm MRD negative. Really exciting, as, of course, have been many people in that study. So, of course, we're seeing really good results of venetoclax, but what we're really seeing is when you add venetoclax to an antibody, uh, we're seeing even better results again. So the Australian trial with the venetoclax rituximab, um, uh, it, you know, looks really quite exciting in terms of the responses that we're seeing. That study's ongoing. And of course, you were part of the original phase one study, um, looking at even how we decide which way around to give the antibody and the, um, and the venetoclax. And uh, it, it achieved exactly what um, we would have hoped for you. But what a cost in terms of personal time, travel, cost of, of doing all this. But um, I, I guess you're a real example of the commitment that people will make for a clinical trial. And of course also the unfortunate situation we're still in that um, people sometimes have to travel really long ways to get into the clinical trial that's right for them. And with, um, as much as I love seeing you every three months and flying to London from Melbourne, it's a lot better than the uh, 10 trips I did last year. Long term, where do we go from here? I mean, obviously I'm taking 400 milligrams a day, not having any side effects. Well, of course, there's two things. I mean, you're in complete remission. You're MRD negative, we know. Um, you are, technically speaking, within the trial, could stop the drug. And we've got some data emerging that some people can stop the drug and have durable times off the, the, the drug. I, I guess the problem many of us face and the slight concern we have is that you stop the drug now, you have a period of time the disease comes back. We don't necessarily know we can get you access back onto the drug again. Um, and therefore it's not quite clear what is the right thing for, for you to do. If you hadn't been tolerating the tablets quite so well, it would almost be an easier decision. You'd say, look, you're not tolerating these tablets very well. We, you are MRD negative, let's stop and see what, what happens. Um, but the very fact you are tolerating the tablets well, which of course is what we found pretty much in that study, people who tolerate venetoclax tolerate it incredibly well and have very few side effects indeed, as, as you do. I mean, you sometimes tell me you don't even remember you're on them. Yeah. And, um, which is different from saying you don't remember to take them, but we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> that Obviously, that is one option, but it, is, it does um, have that risk. And I guess for people um, like yourself who are in the trial, like, you'd probably want to see a bit more data about other people being brave enough to stop and come off um, to be um, you know, thinking about, do I now come off and how long a response would I have off, off this treatment? And what is the data about if I restart venetoclax, will I just get back into as deeper remission again? Um, but I guess we just don't fully know that yet. We're so still how, only a couple yeah. of years in. So how are you feeling about uh, those choices? Oh, I mean, I, I feel so well. So for a start, I'm more well than I've been in years. And I'm taking pretty serious tr treatment. And as you say, it's sort of about remembering to take the tablets. Um, because I don't think, you know, mentally mm. I don't think of cancer anymore. I still worry what will happen if resistance develops, is, you know, transplant is still there in the background for me, which I don't want it to be. Mm. But um, do you think transplant's gone away? Funnily enough, uh, we've, uh, we've just started to see a few more transplants coming through now. Um, so we've done a few more at BART's in the last few months than we'd done for several years because we're starting to see people coming through who have failed these sorts of treatments, often, of course, due to intolerance rather than to true failure. So it's, it, it's going to be interesting to see whether there'll be another new development or whether there'll be a window of time where transplant becomes the option. But of course, many people I put on this trial, I did it as a, as a bridge to transplant, thinking let's get best response. But pretty much, and, and you know lots of people mm. who are on the study with you, lots of those other um, people are all kind of feeling the same way you are. I'm tolerating the drug really well. The, the risk of doing a transplant is quite high. 
let's put it off. So what I'm doing in all of them is what I'm doing with you, is just monitoring the disease closely and being ready to think about it. And you've still got some uh, options personally in terms of other treatments that you could have, but I don't have to think about that at the moment in terms of the response you've had to, uh, to the venetoclax, the venetuzumab combination you received. And in terms of just uh, one thing that we're looking at is how doctors deal with patients like me. You know, these type A, read far too much, get far too many opinions, but ultimately I've found a doctor I trust and I will sort of do what my doctor says. But how generally, well, you, you see a lot of patients because you've got that reputation who, who do fly in to see you. How do you deal with these people that have all this information? What are the sort of soft skills that you have? How can you guide them in the right direction? Well, firstly, I love it. I, I really like people to be very well informed about their disease. I like to spend time helping people to become informed about their disease. But of course, not everyone wants to do that. But I, I, I personally find it really good when people know a lot about their disease and can we can have a dialogue and a discussion. I guess the problems arise where people get a misconception, where they believe that you know, this is the treatment they need when there isn't yet sufficient evidence that that really is where we should be going. That can be a little more tricky. Um, but, but I guess certainly pretty much everyone who's involved in the CLO Research Consortium, because of that consortium and the length of time we've been working together, getting kind of second, third, fourth opinions on patients is, is very much uh, what, we, what we do. The other thing, of course, is by their very nature, um, challenging cases coming to you um, is, um, it, it is exciting. It's, it's kind of what you've hoped that you've built your career up to be able to do is to handle these very difficult cases. And of course, what used to be much more frustrating was having very difficult cases to deal with and not very many tools at our disposal. What makes it much easier now is we've got very difficult cases to deal with and lots of different choices. And quite often the choice now becomes you know, what's the sequence of the, of the novel agents, which novel agent do you start with, which one do you consider, should we be combining them? So these are, these, I think these are exciting times. Wonderful time to be a CLL specialist. Are we going to cure it before, uh, we, before you, you know, decide well, to become a professional I, broadcaster? <laughs> before, <laughs> I, before I hang up my hat, I'd like to say where we're saying. So of course, I do believe we probably have cured that small subset. So that's the start. I thought there was lots of good science at the IWCLL session yesterday. Um, really quite heavy going science, I think, for people that aren't in the field, but I was really excited by a lot of what I was hearing about people understanding the, the clonal sub-architecture of the disease and how we can start trying to get right to the root of the problem and tackle not just the, the bit on the surface, but really get to the piece underneath. And that's where I hope we're going to get. And I I'm, I'm remain very confident that we're if we haven't got them quite yet, we're very close to having the tools at our disposal to cure a significant portion of patients with CLL. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Thanks. <laughs> uh, that's great.